Uh, Dr. Kiran, Dr. Natesh, we are ready to go live. Right, so I'll be starting. Yeah. Good evening, doctors. Uh, I am Dr. Kiran from uh, Shield Healthcare Medical Affairs. Good evening, doctors. Very good evening, doctors. This is uh, Dr. Kiran from Shield Health Medical Affairs. And uh, it's my privilege and honor to, first of all, uh, extend a warm welcome to you. I think uh, we are all living in this uh, extremely difficult uh, pandemic times. And uh, we're all gear up in, uh, gearing up for this uh, word called as new normal. So uh, we believe in doing a lot of webinars. And uh, with this, uh, it is my pleasure, privilege, and honor to uh, introduce you. Uh, I would like to introduce Sir with this uh, small uh, introduction. Sir needs no introduction. Sir is uh, well known, and uh, Sir has done his MD pharmacology, uh, FCSM. Uh, uh, currently, Sir is the director and consultant of uh, Androgen uh, Clinic in Sri Rangam, Tamil Nadu. Uh, sir is also the visiting consultant uh, in Kaveri Hospital, Trichy, uh, Manipal Fertility in Salem, uh, the Deepam Specialty Hospital in Salem. Uh, sir has done his MBBS from uh, Pondicherry University. Uh, sir has won quite a few medals there. Uh, sir then did his MD Pharmacology from Manipal University. Sir has done a fellowship uh, certificate in sexual medicine uh, from uh, CTM IMA. Sir has done uh, SASM uh, Micro Masters program from Manipal Fertility, Bangalore. Sir has also done uh, from the prestigious uh, MD Mohan's Academy for Diabetes, a certificate course in uh, evidence-based diabetes management. Uh, currently, uh, Sir is the president of IMPA. Uh, sir was the immediate past uh, joint secretary, uh, secretary of ISCSG. Uh, sir is the regional uh, representative for South India for SASM. Uh, sir is the bylaw committee member in IHSM. And uh, Sir is extremely uh, uh, vibrant in the field of uh, uh, regenerative andrology and sexual medicine with a lot of uh, interest in research areas also. Uh, with this uh, uh, small introduction, I would like to uh, uh, welcome Sir. Thank you, Dr. Kiran. Thank you for your introduction. And uh, good evening, everyone. I also like to thank Dr. Texas. Uh, for, uh, for having us and is giving you this opportunity to share the information about the role of antioxidants in the treatment, I can keep them, I mean, in because antioxidants is a big gray area where uh, the uh, actual evidence for treating different aspects of pain infertility like is lacking. So we just go with the program here. Now, uh, what are antioxidants? Antioxidants are the agents which break the oxidative chain reaction and thereby reducing the oxidative stress. What are the types of antioxidants? We have endogenous antioxidants and exogenous antioxidants. The endogenous, we have enzymatic and non-enzymatic. Under enzymatic, we have four types. The, the, uh, the glutathione peroxidase, the, like, then the glutathione transferase, superoxy dismutase, and catalase. And in non-enzymatic, we have vitamin A, vitamin C, vitamin D, vitamin E, vitamin B9, that is the uh, folic acid, then zinc, selenium, coenzyme Q10, the carnivores and of course the exogenous we always have the dietary sources along with all the uh, the, the, the other supplements now what are the function of these antioxidants in sperm these antioxidants they protect the sperm from membrane lipid peroxidations as we all know sperm is made up of they have very high uh, uh, concentration of the uh, polyunsaturated fatty acid this proof of which is more prone for this lipid peroxidations so these antioxidants help to protect the membrane lipid peroxidation also, as the sperm mature, that is histone protein conversion. This makes the sperm chromatin more idea, mature form, thereby condensing it, giving it more stability to the uh, uh, sperm chromatin material. So the antioxidants helps to maintain the stability, thereby preventing the single strand and the double strand breaks. Also helps to uh, uh, properly transform the histone, histone to the protein. 
it also helps in regulating the apoptosis by uh, by uh, low stabilizing the apoptotic signals very specially the fas uh, uh, the uh, signaling cascade and also the caspase cascade uh, it also maintains the endothelial integrity in the blood testis barrier these antioxidants act as a cofactor for cellular metabolism and biologics in this sperm they also act as anti inflammatory and immunomodulatory and they are very important in cellular signaling especially in the gap junctions so what happens now so what is the cause of this oxidative stress either that can be decreased productivity or the production of antioxidants or that is increased free radicals it can be either ROIs or RNS that is reactive oxygen species or reactive nitrogen species and these increased free radicals can be either due to increased production or decreased scavenging or both normally what happens in case of an free radical there is an unpaired electron and this antioxidant it donates the electron to the to the free radical that by making it uh, that we having a scavenging activity also now what are the sources of uh, uh, ROIs in the major tract we have one the endogenous source the, uh, the first being the abnormal spermatogenesis or spermigenesis that is the immature sperm which has more than 10% of the histones and during the protein conversion the protein 1 to protein ratio should be maintained if there is a more amount of protein 1 more than protein 2 again it causes increased ROIs and certain cell like is also in uh, a regulator of uh, Process. So, when the uh, sperms are not being regulated by, by the cell signal, that is the uh, because the cell cell has this fast ligand and this fast receptor has been expressed on the sperm, and if it is being uh, poorly regulated, because normally the apoptosis is, is regulated by the caspase enzyme, and when this is not mediated by the caspase, when it escapes the caspase mechanism, the abnormal sperm production increases. And this also causes uh, increased ROIs production. And of course, germ cell body being the, the causes of the ROIs in the major genital tract. And when there is increased amount of leukocytes, when there is infection in the major genital tract, or when there are testicular, like, testicular infections, or a varicocele, any testicular portions, or the systemic diseases like diabetes or arthritis. Now, what are the exogenous sources? One being the smoking, that is lifestyle practices, smoking, alcohol. Recreation drug use like marijuana, cocaine, amphetamines, uh, a lot of junk foods, which have a lot of processed meats or processed sh sugar in there, and obesity and lack of exercise being the most common thing. And of course, comes the occupational the hazards, they get exposed to the uh, like various carcinogens, people working in the uh, petroleum uh, industries, or people working in the pesticides industries, people working in the dye industries, they have increased exposure to this oxygenous uh, source of various. Uh, 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 chemicals and when coming to environmental causes of course the pollution uh, like is more common and the exposure to the uh, cell phone radiation that is the electromagnetic radiation that causes a great risk for uh, the, the production of ROS uh, in this These ROS causes changes in the spermia gram finding the risk. It can cause a fall in congress or spermia. It can cause an altered morphology that is it can cause a teratosospermia or the bacteria that is uh, astinospermia. All three can coexist. So, like it is pretty simple, right? So, once there is a change, so you can give antioxidant to treat it. But various researchers, meta analysis, and the systematic review shows even though there is improvement in the spermiogram, it is not the uh, there is no correlation with the failed in vivo pregnancies, and this is not even correlated with the live birth rates, and it is poorly correlated with the fertilization rates, either uh, like for the um, the in vitro pregnancies, like IVF for it. So this gives us two components for male infertility, that is unexplained male infertility, where we cannot find any uh, possible factor, even though there is a normal seven parameters, or the second one is idiopathic infertility, where there is altered seven parameters without an identifiable cause, plus the absence of female infertility. This gives the rise to the importance of sperm function text, the one being the exposed which that is contains membrane integrity, and second being the oxygen stress indicator it can be uh, the Indirect indicator being the peroxidase test, the direct indicator, we can we, we can measure the ROS by chemilutens, we can measure the ROS tax score, we can always measure the OF using uh, a new system called Biopsis. And uh, DNA integrity can be tested by direct method using a channel and indirect method using this current chromatic test, that is SCSA, and the most commonly and the most routinely used term test or SCD, sperm chromatic dispersion, and the, and the common test. So there's a new uh, uh, terminology being used now. It's called osmosis, that is male oxidative stress infertility, where this encompasses the, uh, uh, the significance of reactive oxygen species, 
when there is a normal sperm parameters with any detectable uh, like like any abnormalities so uh, here at the in the pathological like cause they they mention this term and they give a uh, stress that the importance of testing always very specifically when there are uh, no identifiable cause with this abnormal sperm count now how much or always is too much or always is very essential for the normal sperm capacitation after some reaction the oocyte fusion and it also is required for shutting off the damage from the non fused sperms it is very important for the blastocyst development and the implantation of the embryos so too much of antioxidant therapy can also suppress this always activity and it can be detrimental to the sperm health so this gives us uh, the the, the uh, importance of always measuring prior to this antioxidant supplements uh, I would rather call this as a supplement rather than, like, than medication drawing because these products they don't for, for the pharmaceutical part that is they do uh, they don't go under the typical regulatory pathways of phase one two three and the approval it is not regulated this year it is regulated by the food safety authority the FSA, and it has a need in the pk that is for kinetics or pharmacodynamic studies that work we don't have any bioavailability data this bioavailability data will be giving the effective concentration of the supplements in the seminal plasma to exert a therapeutic benefit, which are highly lacking in this field. And there is no mechanism action data in a controlled trial. So everything is uh, empirical. Therefore, these, these therapies are called as empirical medical therapies for male infertility. And more importantly, these therapies, they don't have safety or adverse drug reaction monitoring facilities, so there is no need of any pharmacovigilant activities. And regarding the recommended daily allowance, there is no fixed uh, guidance. And the RDA is mainly based on the nutritional basis of these, uh, of these, uh, like these, uh, I mean, uh, these medications, all the uh, supplements, but not mainly based on the male input parameters. And this RDA is very specific for in, in ages and, and it varies across the population. So these antioxidant pharmaceuticals mainly actually have these five uh, systems. One it either increases the endogenous enzymatic oxidants, as it, like as antioxidants, either it can be a SOD or I mean, that is a superoxide disputase, the glutathione peroxidase, and the glutathione transferase. It increases the endogenous non-enzymatic antioxidants, vitamin C, A, E, E, B9, carnitine, and the CoQ10. It decreases the endogenous oxidants. Either it can either scavenge the, uh, the endogenous oxidants or it can neutralize the endogenous oxidants. It increases the membrane integrity of the sperms by providing the DHA, that is exohexoic acid or the exoposinic acid, the DHA and EPA, which goes and incorporates on these sperm membranes, they are being, uh, preventing it from the lipid peroxidation. It also increases the chromatin stability of the sperms that are being help, I mean, by helping in the protein conversion and also base by supplementation. Now, coming to the most common use, that is coenzyme Q10, it is a lipid soluble antioxidant. It exists in two forms, the oxidized form called as ubiquinone. And the, uh, I mean, sorry, uh, yeah, the uh, uh, um, oxidase forms called ubiquinone and the uh, reduced forms called ubiquinone. There should be, an, uh, so in case of infertile men, there is a lower ratio of the ubiquinone to the uh, uh, ubiquinone. And like uh, nowadays, many companies are providing directly the ubiquinone in their formulations. Uh, and in varicose patients, they found that there is a reduced filtration of the endogenous coquitin also. And how does it act? It mainly transports or scavenges the electron to the mitochondria electron transport chain. The RDA is not, is not established for this coquitin because it is naturally synthesized. But ideally, they have been giving uh, 200 to 300 micrograms per day. And if you want to titrate the dose, you can go up to 12 milligram per kg per day. Now, coming to the RDA, arginine, which is a water soluble antioxidant, its main mechanism action is it is a precursor for producing. Petrusin, spermin, and spermatidin, which is essential for sperm motility and, and capacitation and absorption reaction. It also acts as a cofactor for sper uh, sperm metabolism. It's a precursor for synthesis of many polyamine, which is important for cell proliferation. And also, it is a very good, uh, a very important precursor for testosterone synthesis. It is a substrate for nitric oxide synthase, which produces nitric oxide, thereby improving the endothelial health. The uh, RDA for arginine is 20 gram, but we don't need uh, that high. And many trials have shown that four to nine grams per day of arginine have been shown to improve the sperm health. But coming to the carnitines, they are the water soluble antioxidants, and most commonly L carnitine and L acetyl carnitine. Uh, it scavenges the ROS in the mitochondrial electrotransport chain by transporting the long chain fatty acids into the mitochondria. 
and also it helps with the bioenergetic recipient by uh, helping with the and the fertility. RDA is not well established for the contents and uh, uh, ideally the upper limit should be 4 grams and most important thing you know, should be noting here, contents are very low in the vegetarian dietary sources. So non-vegetarian, that is meat, red meat, they have high amount of content. So when there's an established content deficiency, these, uh, these can be supplemented for those patients. Now coming to the astaxanthin, it is a fat-soluble antioxidant. It belongs to the vitamin A family, but without a pro-vitamin A activity. Uh, here it is very important mechanism is, it helps in the capacitation. The, what happens during the capacitation is that there is a lipid raft migration, which helps to transfer a protein called lin from the midpiece to the head, thereby helping for the phosphorylation, thyrosine phosphorylation of the head proteins. This phosphorylation changes, causes the membrane rearrangement and increases in the membrane fluidity in the head, thereby helping in the capacitation for the hyperactivation and the absent reaction. National current RDA recommends for oxidantin, the ideal doses will be 6 to 12 milligram per day. Now, coming to the vitamin D, which is a fat soluble antioxidant. Vitamin D exerts its mechanism with vitamin D receptor via calcium dependent and independent homeostasis mechanisms. It helps in tyrosine and thyroidine phosphorylation of the, of the sperm proteins and it's a very, very important molecule for cellular signaling. It has a high role in sperm motility and maturation. It, is, it holds very good role for, for histoleoprotamine conversion and it holds a very important role for the blastocyst attachment to the endometrium and for the further penetration of the endometrium. The uh, RDA for this is 1000 to 4000 in the class in the Vitamin C, uh, L ascorbic acid, is a water soluble antioxidant. It uh, mainly acts by scavenging the antioxidants and recycling of the oxidized vitamin D, which I am telling next. The RDA is not fixed because of age wise recommended changes. Ideally, they are found with that 500 to 1000 milligrams per day improves sperm health. Vitamin E is a fat soluble antioxidant. It is available as a like it's available form is alpha tocopherol. But various forms which give alpha tocopherol, tartrate, citrate, and uh, these all have different bioavailability. Liver doesn't handle the endogenous, uh, like uh, I mean, exogenous vitamin D, like how it handles the endogenous vitamin D. Is, uh, like, the, the vitamin D. So, what are they, so the what research says that even though vitamin D is a good antioxidant, the external vitamin D. Has to be done with very, very, uh, I mean, has to be given very, very cautious way because more amount of vitamin E it inhibits vitamin K, thereby making the patient to have, I mean, uh, make, making the patient to go for a bleeding diathesis. So, if the patient is on any uh, antibiotic drugs, they are very careful because it gives a warfarin high doses, gives a warfarin like state. So, ideally, it is not recommended to go beyond 400 international units per day. That is what uh, the research says about vitamin E. So selenium is an essential taste element. It's a very good uh, cofactor for the uh, for the growth of peroxidase. So externally given selenium gets converted to the uh, the growth of peroxidase and also helps as a cofactor for uh, for for, uh, for moderating the action of this growth of peroxidase. The ideal RDA is 55 micrograms. Zinc is also an uh, essential taste element. It's a cofactor for DNA transcription and protein synthesis. It is a very important role in testicular development, chelatogenesis. Nuclear chromatin condensation, acrosome reaction, and dihydrotestinal production. The RDA for zinc is 11 micrograms. Uh, very uh, uncommon used thing is called the ASIN, it's, it's, an, it's called a harsh chestnut. It is very specifically uh, advised by many researchers for varicose, like a sort of It helps to inhibit the lysosome in the serum uh, and reduces the permeability of the capillary vessels. It, uh, they, have, they have shown that it, it increases the vessel wall tension and strength. And uh, increases the like, venous drainage. But the evidence are very limited. Many researchers have been advocating this ACN as, as one of the compounds for the antioxidant, which may help you to give for the for very specifically varicocele patients or post varicocele tummy patients. In acetylcysteine, I said that like, it's a derivative of natural acetylene acetylcysteine. And it is also a precursor of the rhodotin transferase. Therefore, it increases the endogenous rhodotin transferase, that we are acting as a free radical scavenger. It has an additional mucolytic activity, thereby improving the viscosity of the uh, uh, cement when there is increased viscosity. Also, the RDA is so available for NAC, and the ideal thing is 600 microgram per day. They followed that, uh, like increase the sperm health. The others being the folic acid, it, it helps in giving uh, the 
base patch which is, which is required for this for the for the chromatin concentration of the uh, for the uh, DNA application and uh, vitamin B12 is very like very important for the uh, cofactor for many hydroxyation uh, uh, activity and I want to give a caution on this phytoestrogen like more amount of soy kind of products helps to increase the estrogen concentration in the uh, like body that may be detrimental to this compel so many researchers have, uh, have shown that even the phytoestrogen being national antioxidants it's been in many uh, food products the uh, very uh, caution advice should be given especially when in case of subtle element where they have to restrict the soil products these products are not without any potential side effects the more common side effect being the gastrointestinal side effects i can show you here <clears throat> everything is showing gastrointestinal side effects because like uh, it can people can come with uh, loose motions people come with uh, some kind of a gastric irritation and uh, like uh, the more common with uh, arginine and uh, and carnitine and uh, so so this has to be a technical consideration when coming to a vitamin e reading comp uh, the the complication should be of uh, a very important and uh, over treating with these antioxidants can be very very detrimental so uh, ideally always the dfi should be measured for uh, like in, in case of any subtle men without any uh, like like, like an anything cause and uh, increase or always can be to the infection or abdominal sperms and the sperm dfi hds can help us to other, like understand poor dna packaging and about the immature sperms being present there and when these tests are combined together it can be very uh, like uh, like 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 it can give an idea of the uh, source of the product whether it can be intratesticular or extratesticular or the combined thing many commercial kits are available in the market uh, many companies are uh, are, uh, are, are like promoting the csc testing or the rsc testing and there's a product in market called oxyfrag where they give uh, where there's a extra advantage you can test uh, both ROIs and dfi in the same sample sample which can be sent across uh, through the courier sample uh, in a uh, non liquid nitrogen medium so it's available for uh, patients and it is showing good results also and uh, this can be actually indicated to initiate optimal treatment for these patients. Thank you. If you have any questions, I'm very happy to answer. Uh, sir, first of all, thank you so much for a wonderful, wonderful session. Uh, I think the audience really enjoyed uh, the clinical depth as well as uh, very practical uh, uh, view of. Uh, a great perspective of all the comprehensive antioxidants which you covered. Uh, so thank you so much for that. Uh, sir, if you can uh, open the questions uh, for discussion. Yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, sir, uh, the first question is, uh, with uh, you mentioned the DFI. So uh, what is the importance of uh, sperm fragmentation uh, tests? How can the results of such tests uh, predict the chances of successful pregnancy with a female partner? See, first people have to understand that uh, uh, these tests are poor predictive markers. They don't predict the success of the pregnancy. They can tell, okay, this is uh, the uh, high amount of DNA fragmentation can be a cause of their uh, suffering status. Because what happens, many tests are not being standardized. For example, in Tamil SA, where they handle uh, uh, I mean, like, uh, like, like in Kerala, see all the SEs, uh, say, few tests they handle the direct sample, few tests they handle the uh, uh, density gradient handle samples. So, again, that is a very uh, inconclusive evidence in the trials. And these tests are not predictive of successful pregnancy, but they can give an idea upon which a correction of these causes can help them to be again in the fetal range. This can be helping as one of the uh, additional tests which can show the sperm cell. Thank you, sir. Uh, so moving on, uh, next, uh, next question is, uh, what are the different combinations? Uh, because sir, most of these antioxidants, there's no common combinations. So in your experience, uh, what are the different combinations commonly used in antioxidant therapy? See, uh, antioxidant, like is highly unregulated markets, many companies go like this. They want to have a wide range of antioxidants so that they can go and approach their own doctors which can be appealing for them for a cost benefit uh, thing because they want to see multiple components. So I would rather say if a doctor want to prescribe antioxidant, he should be having multiple uh, brands with him because 
one brand can give an additional alkaline based therapies one brand can give additional uh, selenium based therapies or uh, along with vitamin d so basically they have to see what is wrong with the patient and uh, like for example when there is increased amount of uh, a dfi when there is high amount of hds and when there is high amount of ros he could see what are the causes which can be correctable if, the, if there is no other causes then he can go for the uh, supplements i mentioned before which can improve the the chromatin packaging which can uh, uh, decrease the uh, the, uh, the 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 membrane lipid peroxidations so uh, like um, like i can make the questions most commonly see, i can tell uh, when you are going with asasanthi like uh, 4 to 8 grams uh, like, like 4 to 8 mg and uh, l arginine uh, lycopene like l carnitine multitudes are there so there is no fixed thing i can see but uh, i would like to suggest that going with a minimal approach not putting everything into one tablet and expecting a big thing because nobody uh, knows synergistic adverse effect of these components because we all know about the individual adverse effect but when this come to be a synergistic thing the whole always goes down to a very big tip again this has to be taken with a uh, uh, caution thank you sir uh, sir uh, since you discussed the uh, uh, what should be kept in mind while listening the different combinations uh, the next question also is pretty much related to this uh, what are the factors which should be taken in account uh, while deciding a combination of antioxidants yeah, that is what see ideally you see the patient's factors if they are any correctable factors it's ideal to cut that first number one and second what is the outcome of the treatment whether if the like like if they're going for a uh, natural pregnancy or if you're planning for ICSI or IVF. If you plan for ICSI or IVF, many would suggest that it is not required because anyway, when you, like when you're doing ICSI and we are, are injecting a damaged uh, a DNA like a tense bone, that means the high chance of who's it repaired. So when there's a high maternal age, you can put them on antioxidant supplements for the male. So be, because maternal age, there's a, uh, the who's it repair is low. And uh, when uh, like when coming to pay, patient of smoking or, uh, or, or, like, or obesity, you can always go with uh, the glutathione mediated uh, things, and when the patient having a varicocele, you can always promote Asian component, uh, Asian combined stuff. And if the patient is having, a, if the, uh, and if the patient is a pure uh, vegetarian, where there is a less chance of less chance of having l carnitine diet, so you can go for l carnitine based therapies. So I can like, like sorry, uh, individualized. You can go like this. And if the patient is on vitamin D deficiency. You can always test vitamin D for these patients, in, and if it is deficient, you can always replace it by an antioxidant therapy or a, a, a like very specific vitamin D supplement because it's going to uh, take care of all the vitamin D related uh, health benefits for these patients. Very specifically, the uh, histone uh, the uh, the main conversion. Thank you, sir. Uh, so the next question is: uh, You spoke about uh, the DNA fragmentation and DNA. Uh, so the next question is. Uh, uh, does the antioxidant therapy alter the chromatin structure of sperm DNA? <clears throat> See again, why there's a damage from the like this DNA? Whether if there's abnormal spermatogenesis or when there's an increased ROS being a cause of DNA damage. When there's an increased ROS being a cause of DNA damage, yes, then there's an, a chance of correcting it. But when there is an abnormal, when there's a when there's testicular body, when there's abnormal things happening inside, uh, like inside the testicles, where the sperm is getting immature. These kind of antioxidants can help in reducing the similar ROS, which again puts extra stress on this immature score. So we should see uh, what we are trying to correct it. It is not about correcting only the DNA fragmentation. What is the cause of this DNA fragmentation? If it is purely due to the ROS, yes, this antioxidant have high role of correcting it. If it is not the ROS, if it is due to some kind of a sperm uh, maturation defects, then these uh, then this antioxidants can be a sub, uh, like can be an indirect supplement uh, rather than being a Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, uh, you mentioned about sperm fragmentation tests. So uh, this question has got two parts. Uh, the first part is what is the imp importance of these uh, so sperm fragmentation tests and how the results of such tests can predict the chances of successful pregnancy in the female partner? Can I come again with the second part? One yes, is, uh, what is DFI? Yes, sir. Uh, the second part of the question is, sir, uh, how the results of such tests can actually predict the chances of a successful pregnancy in the female partner? See, that is what a success of pregnancy in a female partner means. Like, success of pregnancy should be there, like, like, like example, male or female. Uh, like, it depends upon multiple parameters. First, we are eliminating the female cause of infertility, number one. And second, 
when there's a male factor, you should see what is the cause of this uh, DNA uh, damage. Uh, it can give a clue that what we are uh, dealing with the patients. It is not okay like your sperm count is low, so, so, so there is some issues over there, so you put on some uh, cocubase therapies or what. DFI is only a additional test. How are we doing that? For example, many labs or, or many centers, they do a CD, that is sperm chromatin dispersion. It's a very vague marker, but like it's not a bad marker, but it's a very vague marker. But when you're doing this uh, DFI with the, with the uh, uh, flow cytometer, the SCAC testing, along with the HDS, it can give us very high information on the, the like even the chromatin packaging also. So whether I'll be dealing with immature sperms, which is causing the highly fragmented DNA, or where or where there is an external source is causing DNA damage. You got it, right? So we're, we're addressing this, then we can tell, okay, this is going to shift from, from the fertile, I mean, from the subfertile range to the infertile range. But there are no studies, when there, there is no proven thing that it can predict sexual pregnancy because they have shown uh, only it can predict success in case of natural pregnancies, but, not, but it is not going with the uh, IV for XC. So again, this DFA can as an additional uh, therapy that advantage of treating the male partners, but not giving a conclusive evidence of sexual pregnancy in females. Thank you, sir. I think that actually reiterates the point you said, sir, is there are multiple uh, factors in both the female and uh, male, which have to be uh, properly assessed to determine the pregnancy outcomes. Yeah, even though if you want to uh, like, like eliminate the female thing, only by correcting the male thing, we, uh, there are many studies have failed to predict it. Because of unknown, uh, like the, the unknown reasons, the the way the like they are dealing with the studies, like it's poorly powered studies, multiple factors are there. But it's worth trying that before going for a vague therapy. Like it's worth thinking, like to see what is happening inside the so, so, so that is what all patients want to see. Whether sir, I, I'm, I'm smoking a lot, will it affect my sperm? Okay, you can test and see if it's affecting them. It goes and hits his way. Okay, I have to stop smoking because this is causing some kind of damage in the sperm. You can you can always advise the patient for life shield in this also by showing these characteristics. Thank you, sir. Uh, so the next question is again uh, uh, with relation to the factors affecting this sperm DNA fragmentation. Uh, in your opinion, what are the external factors related to sperm DNA fragmentation? External factors. Yes, sir. Most common is a lifestyle thing where people uh, uh, they, they like they drink, they smoke cigarettes, or they consume any uh, recreational drugs, and uh, eating a lot of processed food, but not being going uh, like. Uh, uh, which pays for like processed meat or packaged foods and uh, obesity. Uh, uh, then the occupation as well, like people working in the uh, petroleum industry or pesticide industries, and very specifically the environmental pollutants, the uh, air pollution, and also the uh, cell phone pollution, which is causing direct uh, uh, damage to the sperm, even the DNA, also the uh, sperm uh, functioning, also. So, so it's all external factors. Which have high influence on the DFL, I mean, on the DNA. Thank you, sir. Um, I just remember one one uh, one comment which I read online, sir. Uh, generally, this obesity is now becoming a pandemic in India, and uh, probably it suffice to say the way you put it to summarize that uh, uh, the uh, genes are there and lifestyle pulls the trigger. True. I think very apt. Yes. True, sir. but see what is happening. Obesity there are. Uh, High level of inflammatory markers being in the like the obese patient, which again gives the ROS. And in case of obese patient, the inguinal that is the pure inguinal fat is more in the patient. So when they are uh, I mean like like when they are uh, sit, like when they sitting for a long time, this extra part of fat in the thigh it again causes uh, increased temperature around the uh, testes. This also again increases the uh, ROS or the DFI uh, like 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 in this like in this patient. Apart from having a negative influence on the hormone things also, like low testosterone and, and high estrogen, like in the case of obese patients. Thank you, sir. Uh, so the next question is, uh, you spoke about lifestyle uh, modifications. Uh, so uh, the, doc, the person who asked the question wants to know, uh, do lifestyle modifications and diet uh, changes actually help in DNA damage repair? If the damage, see again, how much damage is the DNA? Have, have, have happened. So, if, ideally, I would say if the damage is in the borderline, pure lifestyle uh, modification and completely shifting from the diet, mean, uh, yeah, like, yeah, very good. Again, 
for defending very good day there is no standard for uh, like for anyone because uh, if we if we tell the patient to go on a diet they will go on starving so many centers they don't have a dietary counselors where they had to put a dietary chart and telling these are the diets should be followed because these are the exact things we should be following day in and day out for for breakfast for your brunch for your lunch uh, for your dinner there is no fixed guidelines so we can't tell this is going to actually help but again many studies have proven that lifestyle fa- modification and dietary factors have a positive influence on the spermiogram the sperm health has been improved but the uh, like even the dfa and the rvs have come down again when you going to attribute to the live pregnancy there is no direct correlation but always like uh, like always worth trying that uh, uh, weight loss of 5 kg over a period of 6 months uh, cutting on the alcohol and smoking shifting from uh, uh, processed food or fast food to home based food a good amount of uh, sleep and uh, uh, reduced gadget usage very specifically for men who always keep cell phones in the trouser pockets so these uh, small small things will give a big change in their planning for pregnancy in the long run it is not about for 3 months because they always advise everything for 3 months 3 months can be a benchmark but again if you going to have the lifestyle modification like 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 it has to be beyond this 3 months also thank you sir uh so from the uh, the next question is from dr uh, kadlu satyanand sir you spoke about coenzyme q10 uh so he has a comment saying that uh, coenzyme q10 came with a big bang big bang but uh, off late appears to be gone out of favor so your opinion on this uh, statement sir gone out of favor of whom i don't know i think uh, like i think people is still people are still using coenzyme q10 definitely many uh, many supplements are having coenzyme q10 and the coenzyme q10 is normally present in fruit see i really what is happening nowadays people are always going for this nutraceuticals i want to like give a word of caution while choosing nutraceutical see the validity of the company which you are marketing them ask for something of a data ask for many of the companies they just marketed nobody knows the manufacturing source so please ask the manufacturing source also so like it is not about uh, like going against coq10 it is about which company is promoting the coq10 because there is no priority data there is no pre data there is no pre data there is no safety measures uh so i think uh, coq10 like, like like it is still favor for many one i don't know like like who should be the favor of which like, against fear of using coq10 many companies have been using ubiquinol recently because as i told this slide uh, like the uh, ubiquinol is reduced form this which is very readily available as, as an antioxidant so we don't give that to ubiquinol but again there is no fixed proof that oral like orally ingested ubiquinol directly correlates with the seminal plasma values of ubiquinol again but they have shown that patients with varicocin have a low utilization of of this of this coenzyme q10 and in patient with uh, infertility the uh, seminal plasma concentration of coq10 is low so that is like it is worth with supplementing coq10 along with this uh, the other antioxidants always thank you sir uh, so just to add one one comment to your comment uh, this coenzyme q10 sir i think uh, is also this uh, you spoke about the mitochondrial energization and all these things uh, even in other fields like uh, who are over in reserve also points and put in is giving good results sir, actually some of the data which we suggest that as when like, we are talking about this infertility the common problem is being the low biogenetics which is being from the mitochondria that is the electron transport chain which is male or female so all the the, the mechanism is same that is right yeah uh, so the next question is uh, uh, in case of obstructive uh, azoospermia uh uh this tablet hetrazen 100 mg is commonly used uh, uh are there any other uh, alternatives to this yes sir ha ha amri so is telling about this uh, uh, anti helminthic prakritic but yes why is bringing hetrazen here i don't know obstructive azoospermia but we have to see what kind of obstruction it is right whether the the obstruction is intertestricular or extra but this is of not of this uh, like this topic but again this is a very vague question uh, he can refer to me i can i can answer that surely sir surely sir thank you sir uh, so the next question is uh, sometimes uh, sperm count uh, never increases by any medication uh, can you give any general tips uh, for that sir a uh, good question see 
people what they think is that once you put some medication see this like fever or headache the problem gets solved so when there's a low sperm count being the problem they think that's by taking this medicine this sperm count boosts up and like ideally what happens i have seen two scenarios one patients they themselves go to some labs they see some low sperm count they take supplements and they go to the uh, same lab there is a seasonal variation and even diurnal variation for the uh, sperm count motility and like like an even morphology so they think just by taking medication said that they take a doctor two months back i take this uh, uh, sperm counts this is low then uh, i take this medications i got improvement of 2 million or, or 3 million so they think that this w the criteria of when this 15 million is met the pregnancy is is automatic people should understand the percentage significance third percentile and the 90th percentile the 15 million mark it falls below the third percentile mark it's like it's like less than 15 million is so when the patient is having less than 15 million count the chances of becoming pregnant is very low and as you progress from 15 million the chance of pregnancy is more people have even found out that patients having even a 20 million count has given pregnancy and even 100 million count have not given a, a pregnancy also so this is a very very thing like uh, i mean uh, like a important thing is and they should see what is the cost of this low sperm count if it is a genetic cost when there is oic uh migration cost is being there or when there is any hormone cost being there or any like like uh, any other um, uh, infection cost being there these antioxidants won't just improve the sperm count these antioxidants improve the sperm health by reducing oxidative stress thereby indirectly like like, like it is providing more nutrition to increase the sperm count so again uh, for, for for if you ask me any really, uh, like regarding any tips i would say i will to find out the cost of the low sperm count or the deepening sperm count uh, rather than just uh, pumping these antioxidants for the patient we actually increases the cost of uh, of therapy thank you sir uh, sir uh, 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 suppose somebody is designing a drug for uh, with antioxidants and uh, if we are doing a large randomized uh, clinical study Uh, what could be the possible endpoints? Endpoints for this antioxidants? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. See, very good question. If you're designing a study, you have to start with the patients, like uh, like whether you're planning for natural conception or you're planning for assisted reproduction. It, it can be either IUI or IVF because you see, so it's a different thing. And uh, what is the baseline parameter you have for the antioxidants? We are dealing with all the uh, genetic causes, all the female causes, all the other the like the the influence. So if you're going to take very specifically ROS and DFI, you can always tell. Uh, okay, after three months of this antioxidant therapy, the uh, sperm function has improved. Not only the sperm motility, morphology, but but the sperm function, but like the, like the uh, uh, improved DNA uh, fragmentation uh, thing, and there's a uh, decrease. I mean, uh, improved ROS. Always tax score or the ORP uh, score alone. So uh, these can be the end points while designing a trial. Because once you once you tell the patients, been like for example, many companies they go directly to the doctor, say, doctor, please type a product I can give for a trial. And when the doctor tells that okay, I'm going to give for three months, and when there is no pregnancy, ultimately the product will fail. I would say there should be a proper trial design going into that, rather than being the like uh, the uh, I mean. Only the end point. What is the base and parameters which you want to check? Ultimately, the the this outcome is pregnancy. But if we take only the pregnancy being the outcome, very tough because the product might fail. So if you want a successful product outcome, I would suggest you go for either uh, the ROS level, DFA level, along with the uh, spermic and values. This can be good for starting with the uh, antioxidant and have a very controlled uh, population. Not a very, very one. You have to control them for the diet intake, lifestyle factors, and for the visit of the uh, doctors. Everything has to be controlled. Even the cell phone usage has to be controlled. Everything has to be monitored. Else, what happens when the outcome happens? It becomes an insignificant outcome. Even though it's a positive outcome, it becomes statistically insignificant. So the doctors will fail to accept the outcome, uh, like the post trial. Good question on this. Uh, okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir. Uh, uh... I also recently read a publication which says that uh, uh, astaxanthin as an uh, antioxidant is uh, say 15 to 20 times more powerful than vitamin E and all these things. So, is there any uh, thoughts on the potency of these antioxidants, sir? 
or uh, uh, you, you have any your, your thoughts on that potency is a very very strong term in kun pharmacology what is potency to the uh, potency is amount of drug which is required to produce a optimal response so yes, so you want to compare potency you have to compare head to head uh, like vitamin a means uh, like vitamin c or vitamin e or as any other like like at the very uh, similar dose not the same one for example if you want to test for uh, 5 mg of astaxanthin like like it be even uh, 100 mg of uh, uh, vitamin e the following example so like you can compare that so like you can there is no there is no rational to compare this kind of an, a potency for these antioxidant drugs what we can compare is very specifically the uh, indication with the respect to mechanical action uh, if the patient is having a poor acrosome reaction in this patient you can have a rational of giving astaxanthin based supplements if the patient is having very specifically increased rvs activity and if is if he is not on a very average based diet you can always ask him to take vitamin e as a supplement so as i telling about the potency ask history and see the uh, sperm function test then you can advise his uh, medications and the going to potency test thank you sir Uh, sir, uh, uh, are there any uh, ethnic uh, uh, group variations in male infertility? Like uh, on a broad spectrum, if you see, would you say that uh, uh, as a broad uh, spectrum, I say uh, India is uh, more prone uh, because of all the factors of having more patients of male infertility, or say Asia is more prone, something like that? Yeah, there is a data which I can show you here. Uh, you can share the slide. Sure. Can you see this? Can you see the slide? Can I press this? Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Can you see the slide now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, this is from Dr. Agro et al. This can show the uh, distribution of infertility among the world population, where the Asia being 37 percent, right? Absolutely, sir. Absolutely. This is what you are asking, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. This is from 2015 data. Uh, thank you so much for sharing that, sir. Thank you. Uh, so, sir, uh, I think uh, we had a very, very interactive session. And uh, uh, first of all, I would like to thank the audience uh, for logging in uh, amidst uh, these uh, times in their busy uh, practice. Uh, and a big thanks to you, sir, uh, for a wonderful, wonderful presentation. Uh, I think you you went uh, right from the basics to the clinical aspects uh, to what are the practical aspects which uh, our clinician needs to keep in mind when addressing this uh, big problem of male infertility. And uh, I would like to thank you on behalf of the audience uh, as well as uh, Shield Healthcare, uh, especially for answering each and every question, sir. So uh, you, you you gave uh, uh, in-depth answers for all the questions. Sir. So uh, thank you so much uh, uh, on behalf of everyone, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Kiran. I want to again uh, thank uh, Doc Boxes and the uh, Field Care for uh, for uh, for entering support for this program. So, if uh, like uh, uh, if the audience have more questions, they can always uh, ask them on our uh, info center where I'll be happy to answer. Surely, sir. Surely, sir. Thank so, you, probably sir. if there are further questions, we can collect and mail it to you and get the answers and revert back. Anytime. Anytime. Thanks a lot. Thank you, sir.